Good morning, folks. Today is Wednesday. Let's rock and roll. It is Wednesday. Welcome to episode number 284 of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Lozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Andrew Nakamura, Alfredo, and Lucy Samuel, Philip Moore, and Jeff Watalo are going to be ripping apart the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what you can do with it to operationalize it at work this week, next week, at the macro level, or if you're looking to break in the industry, we've got serious value for you here. Good networking, good terminology, good macro understanding of what is going on. We're going to get into all of that. But first, I want to say... I love Worldwide Wednesdays. I can't wait to get to Worldwide Wednesday, but I do want to share with you my uh, stream sponsors, starting with my good friend Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Shout out and thanks for the stream support, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Guys, if you don't know Barricade Cyber Solutions, they're dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. They help you clean it up. They help you go from ugh to back up and operational in a timely manner. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. Go click on it. Take a little look around. Throw a tab open. Go to it after the stream's over. But Eric's calendar is right here. You hop on. You pick a day, you pick a time, boom, just like that. You've got a meeting with the man himself. Talk about how he can help you protect your business from certain, certain issues. Also want to say shout out and thanks to Recon InfoSec, Eric Capuano, Whitney Champion, Andrew Cook, the gang all over there running some serious operations. If you're in need of a service that provides your organization with 24-7 managed detection and response, MDR, you need Recon InfoSec. Their transparent offering includes the people, process, and technology needed to deliver full-spectrum security operations to organizations of any size. 10-person, 100-person, 1,000-person. MDR is an awesome service, and it's super scalable. They also give you direct access to the Recon InfoSec's team of analysts, engineers, and architects. They're basically partnering with you, right? You don't just throw alerts over the fence to them blindly, and then they throw emails back to you like, oh, you should probably go look at that. That's a bold offering of an MDR service, and that is not what Recon InfoSec does. They basically just augment your staff. It's sick. They do fully managed SIM and SOAR. They've got their own platform called Artemis. It gives you full visibility into your environment. Guys... They are a security company run by security people. It's a critical difference. A lot of SANS knowledge going into the thing that the brain trust up there at Recon InfoSec. Check them out, reconinfosec.com. <clears throat> Links in the description below if you need some MDR loving. I want to remind you, each episode of Daily Cyber Threat Briefing should count for half a CPE. Uh, for CPEs, be sure to say what's up in chat so you can document that you were here. What's up, Jeremy Williams? I see you. Um, and the kiddos. Guys, uh, you know, do your due diligence. I looked at ISC squared and ISACA policies and felt good about how it qualifies. Uh, somebody sent me something about how podcasts might not qualify. I consider this different than a podcast, but... Uh, do your due diligence, but just know um, I'm claiming these as CPEs, all right? Uh, if you're live, love it. Looks like we've got just short of 100 people in here right now. Hopefully people stack in as we start getting into Worldwide Wednesday. Can't miss out on that. Um, and if you're on replay, hashtag Team Replay, want to say shout out to Lenny Wright, who won the uh, OSINT course last week. He messaged me. The guy's a lifelong hashtag Team Replay viewer, so... Uh, you know, I love you, Team Live, but I'm really happy that the day that we did the raffle to be inclusive of Team Replay, a Team Replay person won it. Um, I, I just want people to consume this information and, and crush their work, be awesome at their job. So, um, you know, just I, I love, love, love the Team Replay people. All right, guys, got good news for you. 
Worldwide Wednesday is about to happen. Holler! Now check it out. I'm wicked happy to announce, and I told this shit last week, Worldwide Wednesday is actually presented by IT Pro TV, now IT Pro from ACI Learning. Where's my thing here? I, where, 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 where. Yeah. Okay. ACI Learning is the international online training solution that professionals in audit, cybersecurity, IT, whatever you're into, turn for binge-worthy content. Guys, use promo code SIMPLYCYBER30 if you want to get 30% off your first month, your first year. Uh, the link is right there. The link uh, in the pin chat will take you right to this page. You can see it's set up for Simply Cyber fans or Simply Cyber community members. Anyways, guys, I have been in here. I've been taking Daniel Lowry's IoT pen testing class. Um, gotta tell you guys, I really like the content. It's wicked professional. It's really informed. They have courses, they have practice tests, they have labs. It's sick. So go ahead, check it out. Thank you for sponsoring it. Now, let's get in to Worldwide Wednesday. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna bump this back because the song's only got 40 seconds left and I want two minutes. Start the clock. <laughs> Here we go. If you don't know Worldwide Wednesday, presented by IT Pro TV, now IT Pro from ACI Learning, every Wednesday we see if we can get everybody uh, in chat to see if we can cover all the continents. So tell me where you're at, people. All right, California, Canada's online. Hold on, did I see Kuwait? Yes, Kuwait's on, in the house. Kuwait, 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 Kuwait. Where's Kuwait? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Where's, uh, not Iraq, not Jordan, not Syria. Oh my God, where's Kuwait? Ah. Uh, all right, I'm sorry, Kuwait. Uh, I put Saudi Arabia today. Czech Republic. Check, 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 check. Uh, that's not Czech Republic, but we're going to go with it. Maryland. Ghana's in the house. Ghana, 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 Ghana. Ah, uh, I got Ghana. Texas in the house. Very nice. Kuwait. Love it. Love it. Kentucky. Bluegrass State. Good, uh, good to see you. Virginia, Florida. We got India. Yeah, I saw Kuwait. Thank you so much. Greece is in the house. Ah, uh, Greece, 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 Greece. Uh, it's so small and so hard to maneuver in here. Where's Greece? Ah! All right, I'll come back to Greece. Sorry, Greece. We're doing Germany today. Texas, straight from the hospital. Internal strangers in the house. I'm going to just take credit for it and say he's in Trinidad, Tobago. Yes. Ah! D okay, Dominican Republic today. Sorry, Trinidad, Tobago. Rome, Italy. I know the boot. I know the boot. Do we have India? Do we have South America? I got Ghana right here. New Jersey's in the house. That is its own country. Uh, oh, we do have a labeled map. Um, ah. Ah, no, no. Back up. Crap. Crap on a cracker. How do I, how do I get back? Oh my gosh. Oh, here we go. Um, Iceland. Iceland, Iceland, Iceland. Doink. There we go. Do we have India? I'll have to go back. Central PA in the house. Dan Reardon's in the house. Oh my God. What a hot mess express, guys. This is what happens when you try to use a trackball. <laughs> a trackball, not a mouse. Pakistan's in the house. We're going to take credit for it. Boom. Now, G Greece Greece was over here somewhere in Czech Republic, Kuwait. Um, I, I just labeled them. In oh, there's Greece. Very nice, Greece. Canada, love you. Mean it. Love it. Did we have South America in the house, guys? Did we have South America in the house? Rhode Island, tiny, tiny Rhode Island. Welcome, Darby Crash. Good to see you, India. All right. Did we have, hold on. Did we have, I'm going back and looking. Oh, I got, oh, Chechia is Czech Republic. Well, thank you. Uh, New Orleans was in the house. Very cool. Romania in the house. Romania is Eastern Europe, isn't it? There it is. Boom. Pakistan, we got you, Pakistan. South Korea. Boom, baby, boom. Portland, Maine. Love myself some Portland. Hey, Boston. What's up, Beantown? That's where I'm from. Atlanta, Georgia. Love me some Outcast. Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Yes, yes, yes. Gulf Coast, Mexico. Very cool. Eric McClellan loves himself. Oh, UK's up in here. Some IT Pro TV. Guys, I don't think we got um, South America. I don't think we got South America. All right. Oh, I don't know, Jim Wales. If it is broken, I'm sorry, man. All right. All right, guys. So it looks like we did not get South America. Um, well, well, I guess that's what we'll do when we don't get South America. Uh, 
We have to have a wah, wah, wah. Anyways, good work, everybody. Thanks again to uh, IT Pro presented by, um, brought to you by ACI Learning for sponsoring the Worldwide Wednesday segment. Uh, go check out, guys, I'm just telling you right now, like the IT Pro stuff, like I'm doing it. I, I'm enjoying it. Uh, again, I'm doing a very specific course. I'm doing the IoT hardware hacking one. I've got my bus pirate right here so I can hook into the UART. This guy right here, plug it in hardware style. I don't get to do that in my regular jobs, so I'm taking full advantage of it. All right, guys. Standard issue stuff here. Let's sit back, let's relax, and let's get into the news. Yes? Thank you for playing... Thank you for playing Worldwide Wednesday also. It's it's really my favorite segment of the week. Here we go. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Ransomware attack impacts 1,000 ships. Norwegian maritime company DNV said they suffered a ransomware attack on January 7th, forcing them to shut down servers connected to their ship manager system. In total, the attack impacted roughly 1,000 vessels belonging to 70 customers. DNV noted that ship manager customers can still use offline functionality and that no other DNV services were affected. The company is working with Norwegian police and cyber experts to respond to the incident. All right, so... Let's see. Yeah. You guys, a couple of things here. And BSEC, you know, can probably chime in a little bit more on this than me. But, um, you know, we don't think of transportation and shipping really as like, I, I don't know. I guess like when I think of like critical infrastructure, I think of like energy and healthcare and obviously the financial sector. But guys, transportation of like goods and services is is it's like lifeblood of commerce right I, I was just talking to my cousin this weekend who flew down for that marathon he has to ship stuff to like uh pacific um pacific rim type countries and he, he said it like it take it could take up to a month to get product um to some of these countries uh which which really you know introduces logistics and supply chain and coordination and or uh, you know issues so when one of these ships and this guy dnv is a huge player in this market gets hit with ransomware it really disrupts things guys on this boat could be life-saving medicine on this boat could be microchips right we like we talk about how you know raspberry pis are wicked expensive or there's a chip shortage right you like you go to buy a new car right now and it's like a nine month lead time like this isn't gonna help that so obviously threat actors are like oh okay like they're more like the victim is more likely to pay the ransom offs because they don't want this disruption, right? What's a million dollar ransom when you're a $2 billion company and you just want to get back on and get your business going. So we'll see. It doesn't say whether or not they um, paid the ransom or not. It just says that they were hit on January 7th. So about two weeks ago, um, and it shut down the servers that connect to the ship manager system. So the logistical coordination, the boats are still sailing, right? So they probably executing their final orders or missions. Um, but guys, when they get to the, we saw this with not Petya in uh, Ukraine uh, in, in Merck or Mersk. I always get Merck and Mersk uh, confused, but um, Mersk. When the ship gets to the to the port and they unload each of these shipping containers into the um, uh, like onto the trucks, like where do the trucks go? Like that's all part of the system, right? And InfoSec kids said it too. Yes, there are humans in the there's humans like sh you know driving the thing, right? But it's really all tech. Their whole board is tech, right? Look at look at look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. That's right. Ransomware's the captain now, so you got to be careful. Um, this is obviously, uh, you would think a $2 billion company would have um, contingency plans in place, would invest correctly into um, cybersecurity and have, you know, a plan to handle this, right? So they're doing forensics, so it sounds like they've quarantined and gotten back to normal business operations while they're investigating how bad the attack was. Maybe they called someone like Barricade Cyber Solutions to help them on on, on that. So, 
you see how it says all it has offline functionalities for the boats so this is good so this is this this system was built with cyber cyber resiliency in mind again I, i'm i'm hot on getting the term cyber resiliency normalized in our industry crypto influencer victimized by malware pushed by ads on google over the weekend, a crypto influencer known as NFT God was hacked after launching a fake executable from a site promoted by Google search ads. After clicking an executable for OBS video and live streaming software, nothing seemed to happen. NFT God then quickly discovered that their Twitter, Substack, Gmail, and Discord accounts were all hacked. In addition, all of NFT God's crypto and NFTs had been stolen from their OpenSea NFT marketplace wallet. The hack was likely the work of info-stealing malware, which allowed a remote attacker to swipe saved browser passwords, cookies, tokens, and crypto wallets. Yep. What? Yep, 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 yep. I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. All right. So this is what happened, guys. A um, couple things here, okay? This, this one is good for your end users. In fact, um, I covered this story uh recently right um fbi warns of malicious ads like i literally just covered this december 21st like i like guys if it works they're gonna keep doing it right threat actors i don't want to say they're lazy but like dude if it works why reinvent the wheel like just keep doing more of what's working so here's what here's what's happening. Randock Gaming with the super chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. My friend. Thank you, Randock Gaming. All right, so check this out. This goober, uh, all up in crypto, named NFT God. I mean, okay. And basically, th here's the deal. OBS streaming software. Enter whatever you want. Zoom client, whatever. I just Googled it, okay? This is a legit OBS uh, result. Let's see if I can get a um, an actual ad. All right, so apparently I don't know how to get ads right now on my, like, like I never thought I'd be complaining, but, um, you know, I, I guess I am complaining. How do I, like, what, I don't know how to, like, download, uh, download videos. I'm trying to show you something. Um, all right, so I'm not getting ads, but basically, you know, you guys have experienced it. You Google something, and then like the first three results, somebody paid Google to be higher in the results, right? And then you're hoping, uh, yeah, those blockers do work good, Kimberly, exactly. Um, you you pay to be up there, and anyone who works in marketing, anyone who works in you know business knows that you know if it's a really uh, crowded market, Google charges you more. If it's a really thin market, Google charges you less. And basically, you get put at the top of the list. And who wouldn't want that? Um, most people don't go to page two of Google. So getting on page one, top result, um, is all about SEO. It's all about that game. Well, if hackers or criminals or whatever you want to call them put pay to be the top result, then a lot of people are going to fall right into that bear trap. And think about it. Why wouldn't they? If I Google Zoom download or Chrome download or OBS download in this case, if I'm not paying attention, I'm going to click on the first one because I have been conditioned to think that Google is going to return me the best things for my query. The threat actors pay $1,000, $10,000, whatever dollars to Google to be at the top. Google doesn't vet it. Google doesn't care. Google's just taking cash money, right? Great cash, homie. So Google says, yeah, sure, no, here you go. Put it right there. Then they make it look like the Zoom client, the 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 uh, OBS in this case, whatever it is. They make it look like whatever it is you wanted to download. You download it, you run it, and you're basically installing malware. You are straight up stealing malware, uh, installing malware. This is social engineering 101, and they're weaponizing Google effectively to deliver you that malware. Now, this poor schmuck, he downloaded and installed a info stealer okay redline info stealer it, it didn't say redline info stealer but this one is like so popular right now that um we'll just say redline info stealer okay i was looking i was hoping for one that had like a little bit list of its uh capabilities but ugh, you can't really see it redline info stealer will steal your 
Hey, Russell Butler with the super chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you. So Redline Info Stealer, it basically is a, a Dyson vacuum that the threat actors turn on and they just suck up all your information. They don't care what it is. They'll parse it out later, but your uh, authentication tokens, maybe MFA session tokens, uh, any passwords you might have, probably like uh, screenshots or, or key logging type stuff, like whatever you're typing in, suck it all up. API keys, if they can find it, uh, private PKI keys, SSH keys, whatever. Steal all of it. Exfil all of it. And then, in this guy's case, the threat actors hit pay dirt. They must have been, like, double-fisted excited when they saw the the the, the, the catch come in. The query, uh, uh, oh, the not the query, but the um, quarry come in when they hit someone named NFT God. And they're like, oh, man, we definitely got this one. So uh, the, the, the TLDR here is to educate your end users. You can even use this story to get a great screenshot. OBS streaming dot site is definitely a malicious domain. It is not affiliated with OBS. You can see you can see the ad right here. Can I do this? Will this work? Nope. OK, can't zoom in. Um, can you see this? Nope. Oh, well, I was writing on the screen. You can't see it. Anyways, tell your users, this is what a threat actor does. This is a fake website. You will install a fake thing. Condition your users not to click on ads. Period. End of story. Okay? You can see they got Discord tokens, crypto. If, if guys, hey, if you're in the Simply Cyber Discord server and all of a sudden you get banned or kicked, there's a great possibility that your account has been compromised and somebody took your account and posted a link to a, like, not suitable for work adult um, a Discord server. It's happened a few times on the on the channel, and it stinks, right? Yeah, share it with your family, share it with you know your workers, everybody. Like, dude, this is everybody uses Google right now. Until ChatGPT, you know, unseats Google, this is a legit attack vector that is happening con consistently and regularly. And guys, final thing I'll say about this: think about it. To get to the top of the Google results, maybe it costs ten thousand dollars whatever dude threat actors are going to make more than that so the return on investment is totally worth it it is a business model for threat actors okay this isn't a 14 year old in a basement goofing around with ha like defacing websites these are professional criminals who have workflows systems you know distribution channels that it the works microsoft patches flaws in azure cloud services Microsoft has fixed vulnerabilities in four separate Azure Cloud Platform services. Two of the bugs yeah. could lead to server-side request forgery or SSRF attacks, potentially allowing unauthenticated hackers to execute remote code. Affected Microsoft services include Azure API Management, Azure Functions, Azure Machine Learning, and Azure Digital Twins. Researchers noted they could not exploit Cloud Instance Metadata Services, or IMDS, endpoints thanks to various SSRF mitigations already implemented by Microsoft. At this time, no further action is required by Azure customers. Okay. All right, so, I mean, he, okay, a couple things. One, uh, SSRF, server-side requ server request forgery. It is a... Uh, a common type of attack. I don't know. Um, I'm not a pen tester, so you know uh, this is um, not my area of expertise. But I believe it's one of the OWASP top ten. Uh, so if you're interested in web application security, if you're interested in web application hacking, you should be familiar with OWASP. O W A S P ten. Uh, and I think SSRF is one of those. And basically, it allows you to access um, internal functionality on the server. Uh, by, you know, interacting requests uh, through the front end, I believe. Anyways, long story short, there, there isn't much meat on this story here. Uh, oh, thanks, Wayne's Real World. Thanks, John. Uh, there isn't much real to this story. The, 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 when I read this story, here's what I hear, okay? Microsoft is doing good work to maintain security of the products in the cloud. Another awesome thing, and this is like one of the you know, uh, benefits really, if you want to call it that of moving to cloud services and taking on that type of architecture is that Microsoft patched this Microsoft fixed this in real time. You didn't have to coordinate, uh, 
you know, system downtime. You didn't have to send out messages to your community. You didn't have to test anything. Microsoft just handled it. And that, that's really the beauty of uh, platform as a service or software as a service is that really everything below um, the application layer is managed by the vendor. Um, just really quick. Um, if you guys haven't seen this, this is a kind of a really famous graphic um, and really helps explain responsibility. So check, like, there's a million different versions of it here. Let me, oh, geez, come on, guy. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, so check this out, right? So this is your traditional on-premise. You're responsible for everything in blue, right? Networking, servers, patching, all the crap, apps. Then infrastructure is a lift and shift into the cloud, and you're responsible for the OS and everything above that. But the hardware, the physical security, you, you know, they've taken care of that. PaaS, you go, you keep going up the stack, right? PaaS, you got to do the application. So PaaS would be like Exchange Online, right? Like uh, your your Microsoft email services in uh, Azure, Office 365. You're required to configure those things, but they handle it. And then software as a service is like Microsoft Word. You're literally just an end user of it. Um, this is the beauty of, of cloud and scalability and, and, and responsibility and stuff like that. So all of that's a long way to say that when I read this, I'm like, great, this gives me confidence that Microsoft is taking security seriously and they're maintaining the security of their applications and services. Um, it's scary that no account authentication was required for exploitation of these things. So you may want to go back and look in your logs to see if there's any issue. But the fact that uh, this story seemed to indicate that it was a scary issue, but one that was addressed quickly um, and swiftly and, and comprehensively by Microsoft. The UK and US taking measures to better protect children online. On Tuesday, the UK House of Commons reached an agreement with Parliament to modify the online safety bill to ensure its passage. The bill stipulates that tech company execs found deliberately exposing children to harmful content could risk steep fines and jail time of up to two years. The bill will now move on to the House of Lords for a potentially lengthy review. Meanwhile, in the US, after a year of stalled efforts in Congress to expand children's privacy legislation, at least five states are plowing ahead with bills to address how tech companies collect and use children's data. The states include New Jersey, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia. Experts warn that state bills will need to address compliance and enforcement concerns in order to be effective. All right, there's a lot going on here. Um, there's a lot going on here, okay? So uh, privacy, okay. So a lot of times privacy will um, will overlap with uh, cybersecurity. Larger organizations will have privacy officers and privacy programs uh, separate from information security programs. Um, but if you think of a Venn diagram where the confidentiality uh, in the CIA triad, in the, the like the area that I care about in protecting my businesses and, and end users. Um, well, whatever. <laughs> this is just some random site I found um, with this graphic BSEC. So, um, pri so privacy does come in, but you don't have to be a privacy uh, wonk to, to like really appreciate it. Now, here's the thing. Children are getting access to tech all over the place. Five-year-olds with iPads, Roblox, Fortnite. Like there's, there is a massive adoption. There is an integration um, of tech stacks and children and online identities, personas. Kids are kids. Kids make bad decisions. Kids, you know, it's our, there's a reason that kids typically live at home until they're 18 and then they go off. It's because they need to be educated and taught how to behave and how society is, or at least this is my parenting, uh, you know, philosophy. You're, you're, you're supposed to help them understand. They don't know they don't have any idea what is socially acceptable or what is appropriate or what bad guys can really do. Dude, if my, if my kid asks me one more time to like go do some random, you know, website to put in some random code because he's going to get free Roblox promise the guy on the stream said it, I'm, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm like, my kids are really well versed on, um, crypto scams, online scams, all the scams, right? We're running EDRs on the kids' devices and stuff. But anyways, the point is children's privacy is a very serious topic and one that 
cannot move at the speed of government. It needs to move much faster. So a lot of people um, in, in government positions at the state level, uh, federal level, I've even heard it over in the UK, are focusing on this and beginning to pass privacy laws. California has a lot of privacy laws, um, but it's it's kind of like the general population. Now we're looking at specific to children one. And I want to remind you guys, children... Um, like, you know, they're impulsive. They make buying decisions, like, without thinking through ramifications. This is why, like, in the 40s and 50s, when TV first came on, uh, advertising was, like, getting integrated directly into cartoons, right? Who hasn't seen Fred Flintstone smoking cigarettes? So, like, children are a target market for for sales and, and marketing because they're they're easier, frankly. So, I appreciate this. Um, I'll be interested to see where it goes. Um, I've also seen like on a separate thing, not to not to get too much into this, but I actually saw um, a legislator in the UK. So like whatever the UK people are, the parliament people or whatever, the House of Lords um, talking about, you know, like toxic masculinity and, and the effect that people like Andrew Tate is having on the youth in our world and, and normalizing certain uh, despicable behaviors and how and how to handle that as well. So it's not just privacy in that, you know, not showing your your bits and pieces on stream or, or taking inappropriate photos or whatever. It's it's a much bigger it's a much bigger issue about, you know, exploitation and marketing and, and a lot of risks associated with children and their young minds. OK, so I'm actually super pumped that this is coming out uh, and we'll see where it goes. The United States hasn't been able to develop a comprehensive federal policy. There is the COPPA, C-O-P-P-A, but that's like old privacy legislation designed for children. Uh, it probably needs a refresh. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. So stay tuned. I'm, I'm hoping to see this one develop. And now a word from our sponsor, Serbi. Did you know that over 60% of cloud applications used by your company don't support identity standards like single sign-on? And that these applications are Microsoft the leading Defender. cause of breaches? Serbi can help. Serbi discovers new applications, eliminates manual security tasks like offboarding, and addresses misconfigurations like disabled 2FA while increasing employee productivity. Wait, a security tool that increases productivity? Yep. Learn more at serbi.com. That's C-E-R-B-Y. Com. All right. Want to say what's up to the 192 people in the stream right now. Worldwide Wednesday. We almost got it. We missed South America. But now it's time for some simple minds. Guys, I want to thank all of you for being here. All 192 of you. Thank you all so very much for taking time out of your day to be part of this experience. And really genuinely appreciate your contributions to the Simply Cyber community. If you are getting educational value from the stream, if you're getting entertainment value from the stream, thank you, Jeremy Williams, for the super chat. Guys, if you're getting any value, or maybe you're getting educational and entertainment value, take a second, hit the like button. It really goes a long way to helping you to understand that this is a stream that cybersecurity people like, right? Obviously, thumbs up like, and it will reach out to other cybersecurity professionals who are on YouTube right now and suggest this stream. This may be how you found it because we hit the thumbs up button the day before you found us, right? And YouTube pushed it to you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I hope the boo boo bus is good. I hope the kiddos got off all right. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Oh, Justin Gold with the harsh. I love it. All right, guys, I want to remind you, if you don't know, every single Monday, unless it's a holiday, then it's Tuesday, I send out a newsletter that I write, simplycyber.io slash newsletter. It'll give you three pieces of actionable intel that you can use immediately to reduce cyber risk for your organization. I'm telling you right now, this one right here is going to be the end user one next Monday. So <laughs> you heard it here first. But there's one for your end users, one for your executives, one for your peers, Sign up, check it out. If you don't like it, unsubscribe. No hard feelings. I don't really mind. I do it as a community service. A reminder, because they did sponsor the Worldwide Wednesday, there is a pinned comment right now on the top of the stream. Uh, I'm I'm partnering with IT Pro TV, um, now going to be called IT Pro by ACI Learning. If you're uh, interested in getting some education, a really high quality education that's curated, organized, and professionally developed, 
Uh, check out IT Pro. You get 30% off with the code Simply Cyber 30. You can see they have more than just cybersecurity, right? There's governance, ISC squared, big data, cybersecurity, practice tests for all the things. So if you're doing Sec Plus and you want to knock out a practice test, there you go. Doink. Easy, easy, easy. I'll let you guys know, like I said, I've been working the uh, IoT pen testing course by Daniel Lowry. I've been enjoying it, but it's like 30 hours of content, and I, you know, it's going to take me a while to get through 30 hours, so check it out. Oh, Michael Huskin saying it helped him with a CISP exam. Very nice. Want to remind everybody that this Thursday, tomorrow, Ian Garrett will be my guest on Simply Cyber Live, January 19th. Um, I did have a wrong date on the graphic here. I've since corrected that. But hopefully you can join us and have a good time as he tells us how to go from zero to cybersecurity startup. He'll tell us how to get investment dollars, how to talk to VCs, how to have a business plan, all the work. So if you're even remotely interested in launching your own business, come check it out. Let me take a sip of this coffee, then we're going to get going here. Nice. Nathan Bullen says it helped him with CH. Guys, it's a legit, it's a legit company with like really good product just depends if you need it or not right now all right guys let's get back into the news i kind of i kind of want to wait for the la 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 la's though you know now nah, let's get into the news we'll do the jaw jacking later microsoft locks door on guest authentication in windows pro windows pro builds with win 10 version 1709 or later and windows server 2019 smb2 and smb3 will no longer allow guest account access to a remote server by default microsoft said that the guest logins don't require passwords and don't support basic security features like signing and encryption therefore guest users are more vulnerable to a variety of attacks like phishing and other malicious server scenarios the move brings Windows Pro Editions in line with the stronger security in Enterprise and Education Editions, which stopped allowing guest access by default since Windows 10. All right. So this is wonderful. It's like ridiculous that it took this long to get done. But guest logins are not going to be allowed for remote access of Windows systems, uh, specifically um, Windows Pro. So... You know, if you're running Windows 11, you know, or Windows 10, Windows Server, you 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 may have been able to uh, remotely log in with a guest account. Um, you won't be able to do it anymore. So for the for the few people here that somehow have guest login to remote computers as part of their business workflows, that won't work anymore. And you probably know that you like you probably know that it shouldn't be happening. You probably, you probably, every time you log in with a guest account, you probably say to yourself in her monologue, you're like, ah, oh, this is really bad. I should really fix this tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, so this is going to basically protect you from yourself. This is going to, you know, basically Microsoft has been doing well. Uh, I mean, we even saw it earlier with the SSRF story here. Microsoft is doing really well with, consistently improving overall security kind of by default, right? Whether they're patching systems in Azure, whether they're removing functionality, like uh, not allowing macros in Office documents, right? Disabling them, stopping SMB shares, right? Microsoft is taking a more active approach in dictating what is okay and what is not okay instead of allowing the engineers and the end users to dictate what is okay and what's not okay. And frankly, good i'm glad they do that it's easier less mistakes more secure so expect this to happen github code spaces can be used to deliver malware github code spaces is a cloud-based development environment that allows code base management from a web browser or via an integration with visual studio code researchers showed that a threat actor could create a code space and download malware from an attacker controlled domain and set the visibility of the forwarded port to public to proliferate rogue payload downloads while the technique is yet to be observed in the wild, the findings are a reminder of how threat actors could weaponize cloud platforms to their benefit and carry out an array of illicit activities. Okay. GDPR. Uh, this isn't really anything new uh, per se. Uh, so GitHub Code Spaces, you know, it's kind of, it, it seems to me, I don't use Code Spaces, but it seems to me kind of like a continuous integration, continuous deployment 
uh, type DevOps functionality for GitHub code. Uh, and basically, a threat actor can put malicious content into one of these containers, right? Like a, like a Docker space or something, and then make it available for download and trick an end user, this is the victim, into installing it. Uh, and basically, because of this uh, port forwarding thing that they're allowed to do, they basically leave an open door, like a side door, that the threat actor can come back and go through and do this malware delivery right here. So update um, new payloads, you know, key loggers, ransomware, whatever it is. Maybe you're selling, maybe like you're an initial access broker and you're actually selling access to environments. Uh, and whatever, whoever pays you, you're like, well, well, okay, so you bought it. Now, like, what payload do you want me to push? Oh, Redline Info Stealer, no big deal. Doot, doot, doot. And the new Redline Info Stealer malicious content gets delivered. Uh, the reason I say this isn't really new is because we've seen multiple times people create uh, malicious GitHub repos or clone a popular repo and, and then put like a malicious import. Uh, into the code base and it gets picked up and downloaded and then you know victims are installing malware so if you are i guess the tldr here is this is an interesting concept so just from a case study if you want to study how attackers um, in 2023 can push malware and payloads like from a case study perspective this is a great way to do it um, this would be interesting in a interview to kind of drop this knowledge bomb. Maybe they say, you know, like in an interview, I could see something where they're like, oh, like you you detect some malware on an endpoint. You know, what would what would your next, like what would you be your steps to investigate whether or not it's actually malware or whatever? And yeah, you go through the normal steps, right? Like look at it, like look at traffic, you know, maybe users, whatever. But then if you were just like, oh, you know, I, I'd also look at, um, you know, if they were using GitHub code spaces for DevOps uh, arrangement, I'd be interested to see if they had that default port forwarding. I recently had read about how GitHub uh, code spaces allows threat actors to actually open a back door through port forwarding to allow additional malicious payloads to be dropped. I would definitely look in the network logs to see if any of that type of activity or look at the endpoint to see if the port forward, uh, see if there's a listening port or if there's a network configuration for port forwarding. Right, and then the the person interviewing you is just like, "What?" Right, and you're like, "Oh no, big deal. I'm just really good at staying informed on current threats." Oh, I'm sorry. What you the you just want to hire me now? There won't be a, a follow up interview. Yeah, we can do that. Great cash, homie. Fines surge 168 percent in a year, according to a new report. The cost of GDPR fine. Uh, really quick, Harish, port forwarding. It's basic. Think of like a um, like an like a router or something in your environment it, that so you have a listening port on your endpoint, right? That's listening on like port fifty or whatever, right? Or five thousand. And then when a when a network packet comes in to the router on whatever port you want it, the router is configured to forward it to your computer explicitly, like a rule. Um, think of it as like a 301 redirect, right? If you want to use kind of a comp, like the, the traffic comes in and the port says, oh, no, we got this. Uh, it's going over to this endpoint. Um, it, it's kind of how you can expose an endpoint to the internet without plugging it directly in the internet. You can configure the router to, to, to forward traffic to that endpoint on explicit, um, if it comes in on an explicit port or from an explicit uh, IP address. You you often see, like a great example, you often see it um, like back in the day with video game consoles, right? So you've got a video game or your your computer um, to play video games, but you need it. You need the server to make a connection in. So you'd set up port forwarding on your router. Okay. And surged over 2.9 billion euros or 3.1 billion US dollars over the past year, although the average number of reported breaches per day fell slightly. The report included penalties levied by the national data protection regulators across the EU, as well as the UK, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Meta received the year's largest fine at 405 million euros leveraged by the Irish Data Protection Commissioner for failing to protect children's data on Instagram. Meta then racked up another fine from the DPC for 390 million euros for other user data processing issues. Bridge. All right, so this is kind of fun, and, and thanks everybody for the uh, the the extra 
context on port forwarding. I love Wes's description, the VIP list. Um, okay, so GDPR finds surge. We've been talking about this all year. This should come as no surprise. Uh, you know, Ireland, France, they are running, uh, running point, if you will, on finding the crap out of people, mostly social media companies, definitely big tech companies. Uh, they say here, Meta, aka Facebook, uh, leads leads the charge with a uh, $429 million penalty um, and another $400 million penalty. So they, they're getting slapped all over the place. By the way, I want to point out that they talked about Instagram and part of the fines was around how Meta handles children's data. Mm, sound familiar, right? When we're talking about this story, right? It all ties together, guys. There's a reason that legislators are losing their mind and trying to move quick. Because things like this is happening, right? You're, we're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars fines. Um, that's a good question, Adam Frank. Anybody in the UK? I know there's some people in the UK on here. Uh, what happens to the money that gets uh, collected by the GDPR? I'd be curious if it goes into some like, you know, public service fund to help, or if it just goes into politicians' bank accounts. I mean, I, obviously, I'm being facetious, but you know. Um, I'll tell you what, guys, until 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 the financial penalties or the criminal penalties for doing these things are painful enough that Meta is losing money or whoever, you know, the, the fined organization is, is losing money. They're going to continue to do it. And why wouldn't they? It's making money. An arena enhances NHL fan safety. Nashville's Bridgestone Arena, which is home to the Nashville Predators and hosts events such as the Country Music Association Awards, recently installed 14 Evolve Express security screening systems at the venue's various ingress points. The system uses a combination of artificial intelligence and sensor technology to provide threat detection at high volumes and speeds. An arena spokesperson notes that the system has produced operational efficiencies and, quote, most importantly, happier and safer guests, end quote. Nearby Nissan Stadium installed these same systems and detected 254 prohibited items in a three-game period and freed up 66% of gate security personnel to perform other security-related duties. Okay, couple things here. Couple things here. So basically, they're installing a Overwatch system. The idea is it uses AI um, <laughs> and sensor technology to provide threat detection at high volume and speed. So that's a little bit of marketing spiel. But uh, what I find interesting is the following. It says it detected 254 prohibited items. So what does that mean? Like people sneaking in booze or like an assault rifle. Okay. Second, um, you know, for better or worse people, it, this is going to happen. 280 security personnel used to have to work the gates. Now they need... 66% less of them. So as a consumer of the product, when you're walking into a game, you're, there's less bodies there. So you don't have to deal with that. There's less um, friction going through like the screening things, right? Plus I might add that, I mean, that you've seen a million jokes um, on memes and online of people going through security checkpoints at sport games. And, and like basically the person doing it is doing a terrible job of actually screening you, right? They just like, Run, they just like run their hands down your side and they're like, you're good to go. And like, meanwhile, you've got like a, a, a fifth of fireball like jammed in your waistline and you're like, I'm going to get crunk up in here. Right. So th those personnel aren't always doing the best job anyways. So this is definitely going to happen. This is one of those instances of AI uh, really in tech, really helping kind of move things forward. I do want to point out one thing. Um, I do want to point out one thing. Um, yeah, th like obviously it's a good story that, you know, if somebody brought a weapon in, uh, if somebody's like wicked hammered and like a, a danger to themselves or to others, um, you, you want, you want to be able to detect them and get them out of there right away. But I do want to point out, um, this technology can be weaponized, right? So I didn't cover this story in the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, but I did cover this. This was December 21st, 2022. A lawyer 
who in her personal time was taking a Girl Scout troop out to the Rockettes show. Uh, she's a lawyer by day. She went to the show at night on her own private time. She's a lawyer and her law firm was suing whoever the company is that owns the Rockettes and Radio City and Music Hall. And she walked in and one of these detection systems flagged her and she was promptly basically picked up and removed from the premises because uh, because of what she's doing for her job, right? So she's not, she wasn't a threat. She didn't, she wasn't hammered. She was just, you know, all goosed up on Thin Mints, right? Taking Girl Scouts out, like a really, really uh, wholesome effort, chaperoning. And this system was used to detect her and remove her from the premises. So you got to be mindful, guys. Um, this technology, tech is just like, it's, it's powerful, but it, it's all about how it's used, right? Tech can be used in wonderful ways to identify horrible, horrible people and get them, you know, you know, get them addressed. But it can also be used to identify political opponents, uh, hack, you know, activists in your community, people who are opposite of your um, philosophical opinions, right? Pro-life, pro-choice, right? Maybe if you own this, you identify those people, right? And, 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 you know, remove them or, you know, begin stalking them, right? Say you're a stalker, boom, like all up in here. So you've got to be, you got to be careful with this tech. And for me, it's all about oversight. It's all about oversight. Uh, okay, so that's going to do it for the news of the day. I want to thank everybody for being here. We do have like a bonus story um, for you. Here, let me, let me uh, play some music here. What's this one? Play. There we go. We do have a bonus story here. Chiller Instinct, from what I understood about the story, asking the woman to leave had to do with her day job and the company she worked for who were... Yeah, exactly. But she was there privately as a chaperone of a Girl Scout troop. All right. Hey, we do have a bonus story. I want to give a shout out. If you were here just for the news, thank you very much. Bonus story, compliments of Jax Scott of Outpost Gray. She sent this to me right before I went on. Uh, just want to point it out to you. Uh, the President Biden in the U.S federal government is going to be actually releasing a new executive order here before the end of the month. The order is going to be called um, National Cybersecurity Strategy. It's a 35 page document and basically it, it outlines that just being defensive is not enough and it's going to, it's going to do a couple things. One, it's going to kind of empower the US government like officially to hack back on threat actors with the goal of dismantling, dismantling criminal operations and threat actor operations. Secondly, it really identifies the public private sector, um, critical infrastructure, colonial pipeline, for example, uh, some of these other, you know, critical like Chevron, right? Like some of these really critical private businesses and working with them um, in order to protect their organizations or potentially hack back uh, regarding them. So stay tuned for this one. This one's kind of crazy um, and super aggro. So we'll we'll see what happens. But Biden, you know, ever since Clinton, right? Clinton, Obama, Trump, Biden, there's been more and more legislation around cybersecurity. And this is yet another piece that's going to be important and help shape policy for the next couple years. Um, now, the, the only other thing I'll say, and this is not a political show, so obviously I'm staying clear of that. But like right now, some of these some of these policies would require House support, and the House of Representatives, if you if you've been following the news, is like a train wreck. Like the, the they can't even get out of their own way. So I don't know how much like governing that group of individuals are going to do in the next two year period. But, you know, so stay tuned. I think it's going to be interesting. There, this this um, cybersecurity strategy is supposed to come out in the next couple weeks. So I will be reporting on it. I hope it's covered in the daily briefings. If not, I'll do a special one-off, okay? All right, thanks to Jack Scott for bringing that up. All right, guys, that is the news. I've got a couple minutes to jaw jack. I had to abruptly end yesterday. 
Um, and I've got another meeting later today, but I got a couple minutes. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. Let's try to get Worldwide Wednesday uh, next time. Get South America represented. All right. Let's see who's up in here. Justin Gold, Gaming with the Cat, Asha412. What's up? Have a great day to you too. Andrew Nakamura, my pleasure. Hey, Lupe Peterman. I hope you're enjoying the GRC work. Lupe, long time Simply Cyber community member and GRC analyst, I might add. Whoop, whoop. Joshua B's up in here. Hey, Nathan Bowen, thanks so much for the kind words. Have a great day, unfortunate. What's up, Carrie? Good to see you. Carrie, when's your A-plus exam? Your second one. Oh, Shane Himes, my pleasure, man. Jawjacking with Jerry. We got to get a jawjacking emote. We've got emotes for days. Oh, Leonardo. Yeah, Leonardo. I know, man. Have a great day. Go, go study, man. Fabio, good to see you. K. Scott Powell, I hope. Got a meeting with my boss about a promotion. K. Scott Powell. Go crush it. And hey, K. Scott Powell, I hope your recovery is going well, man. I saw those pictures. You are all dinged up. Speedy recovery. Best wishes. William Welch, looking to TCM Academy. Good stuff. Good stuff. Guys, I started working on the, um, started working on the course. Um, Cyber 101. I got to tell you guys here, since you guys are hanging out, I I'd love some feedback. One second. I got to, I got to log into this thing. Oh, what do we got here? Oh, gifted subs. Thank you so much for the gifted sub. Who's the lucky one? Octavius Williams nailed it. Thanks so much, DP. DP with the gifted sub. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Love it, love it, love it. Very kind of you. Enjoy that, Octavius. Get right up into the... Um, get right up into the... Uh, Emotes. Hey, Jack Scott, we did cover that executive order. Thanks so much for sending that along. All right, guys, this is still early, but I want your thoughts on this, okay? I want your thoughts. Here we go. This is the Cyber 101 course that I've been working on. Check it out, okay? There's 14 modules. We got a tech primer with labs, a people primer, threat actor workflows, weaponizing the internet for fraud, how to do that with labs, denial of service attacks with labs, malware with labs, defender tech and operations, so MDM, MDR, EDR, firewalls, email gateways with labs, espionage, let's commit espionage, corporate and government. GRC, it wouldn't be a course without GRC, right? Obviously, got to love me some GRC. Uh, crypto, as much as I don't like crypto, I have to add it to any Cyber 101 course. Vulnerability management, cyber warfare, course conclusion. Here's what I, here's what I want to ask you guys, okay? I'm thinking this is probably going to be like 30 hours of content. This is a full college semester course. All right. I can do one of two things. I can either split it into two courses, call it Cyber 101 and Cyber 102 and have it like, you know, seven modules each and, and probably get, get, mod, get it out faster. Uh, or I could, I could have it as one super course. Um, you know, and I, I, I would probably, I, I haven't figured out what I'm going to charge for this thing, but um, it basically, I'm trying to decide whether to do it as one course or two courses, Cyber 101 and Cyber 102. I'm thinking 102 just because it's so freaking big, but let me know what you guys think here. South Africa's in the house based on this. It is based on the Citadel course. Like basically I've been teaching the Citadel course for like three or four years and there's, there's, there's gaps in it. And this course is basically my Citadel course on steroids. Like I've added way more content and depth to the things that the Citadel course covers. And then I've added things that I think are gaps in the Citadel course. All right. A lot of people are saying splitting it into two. All right. Full course, charge more. 
Hope it's what you pay for. Charge. Yeah, split split the course. Split it. How do you eat an elephant exactly? Yeah. Okay, Kimberly, thank you. Split it. I'm really excited. I've got this additional digging section. So, like, if, you, if there's something that really sparks your interest, I'm going to have a ton of resources where you can you can go deeper on all of this. I'm obviously going to quiz you on your knowledge. The labs, I'm super pumped. I'm going to be building labs. I think I'm going to partner with Hypercube. I think I'm going to see I've already started building the labs here. Don't tell anyone. I've been working my A off. Like, you know, so we got these labs. Um, submit it. Hold on. Basically, you'll be able to... Um, I'll build these templates and then we can launch them. How do, I, how do I launch these things? I forget. Anyways. You guys get it. I forget how to launch it. Anyways. I'm building these labs out. It's annoying that I can't launch this thing. Launch. I don't want to edit the note. I want to launch it. Whatever. There's definitely a way to launch it. I don't know why, like, what it is right now, but... How do you do this? Edit? I don't want to edit. Oh, so you can kind of see... I mean, it's simple labs, right? Like... Here's a Cali box. Here's a Windows 11 box. Like, go in and do these lab things. That's what that's what the deal is. All right. Okay. Two courses. All right. So I'll do two courses. Okay. All right, I'll do two courses. I'm looking at it. Yeah. All right, so I'll split it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, community, for the feedback. I like it. Although I will tell you that I, I've also, I've, you know, as I've been thinking about it, um, I'll probably have um, this technology primer section the same in both courses. So like if you just signed up for 102 and you didn't do 101, there's certain things that I need to make sure that you understand and know. So there could be a little like a little bit of course content duplicative, but it, you know, basically if you've already taken 101, you can skip this section um, just to make sure that people aren't getting overwhelmed. But all right. I just listened to the executive order review. Oh, good, Jax. I like that. Everyone have a great day. Jumping off. Go Jack Scott. All right, guys. Well, I will split the course. Thank you very much. Oh, Kayla Rose. <laughs> I'm still trying to get Cody Kinsey on the stream too, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I do have a... Uh, so the Cyber 101 course, 102 course, I, I'll work on those next. Uh, I do have a concept for an advanced GRC course. Um, basically, it would be practical enterprise risk assessment, which is more of a more senior GRC analyst um, activity. Usually takes like three to six months uh, to do it correctly and, and, you know, report and everything like that. That's on my schedule for the fall, maybe my 2024 course. Um, so stay tuned. I'm trying, people. I'm trying. I'm trying not to get burnt out or overwhelmed, too. But, all right. If I ever have to interview a G... <laughs> Thanks, Gaming with the Cat. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today's stream. Thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you for your input. Thank you for the squad support, as always. I genuinely appreciate all of you. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Time for the Cyber Threat Briefing because tomorrow is Thursday, and Tuesdays and Thursdays I do it at 10 a.m. until the summer because I teach. Be good, everybody. We'll see you in the next one.